Welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing in our series in Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies with our third read in Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is entitled Academic Facts and Fallacies, and today's read is going to be in the section entitled Academic Finances. As mentioned previously throughout the course of this series, we are doing this series as a parallel read with Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. So I'll put a link in this video's description to that series so you can follow along there as well. As I've also mentioned throughout the course of this series and this read, that um, at the end of each read, we will be doing an analysis and review for each read. So I'll put a timestamp in this video's description so you can jump straight to the analysis and review if that's what, how you'd prefer to go about this. Uh, one caveat before we start, uh, this section is fairly long, and in, in this section of this read, the read is uh, broken up into several subsections. I'll let you know throughout the course of this read when we get to those subsections. So without further ado, <clears throat> excuse me, let's dive into today's read, which is Chapter 4, Academic Facts and Fallacies, with the section Academic Finances. In financial discussions, costs and prices are sometimes confused. Costs are what universities pay to their employees and to suppliers of everything from electricity to office supplies in order to carry on their varied activities. Prices are what they charge other people, whether for educating students, doing research for the government or, pay or private industry, or other activities such as staging sports events or publishing books and academic journals. The most prominent of these prices is tuition, and it has become a very prominent item in many families' budgets, together with the other expenses of sending a student to college. As a former dean of Harvard put it, quote, a single year's bill at most private universities, not just the top-tier ones, is now about the same as the median U.S. household income, end quote. While the incomes of academic institutions must cover their costs, as with other institutions, whether profit-seeking businesses or nonprofit organizations, there are some financial factors at work peculiar to colleges and universities. Costs Although cost is a short and apparently simple word, it conceals a wide variety of complications, whether in, ac whether in an academic or non-academic context. Costs are often confused with prices, but they are very different things. Costs refer to the expenses incurred to produce goods and services. Prices are what the consumers of these goods and services are charged. Price control laws, for example, can reduce prices without having the slightest effect on costs, which is one of the reasons for the adverse effects of such laws. Even when we are clear that what we want to consider are the costs of production, there may be no such thing as THE cost of producing a good, given good or service. Mass production brings down the cost per unit of many goods, so the cost per unit of producing many things depends on how many units are produced. In, academ in economics, costs usually refer to the inherent or lowest cost of producing a given quantity and quality of goods and services. Otherwise, any outlays of money, whether caused by inefficiency, irresponsibility, or corruption, would be counted as production costs. But as already noted, there are academic policies and practices which inflate the actual financial outlays of colleges and universities well beyond those inherent costs, whether these policies and practices originate within academic institutions or are imposed from the outside by accrediting agencies, the American Association of University Professors, or others. A federal investigation in 1990 turned up examples of government grant money being used at Stanford to cover part of the $17,500 cost of the university president's wedding reception and $2,000 a month for flowers at his home. Nor was Stanford alone. Other universities began making quote-unquote corrections to their accounting and returning money to the government as news of the federal investigation spread. What this means is that anything colleges and universities choose to spend money on is called a cost by them, and is then used to justify raising tuition and calls upon the government and other donors to help cover quote-unquote rising costs. These costs 
have included the building of a high-tech center six miles away from the campus of the University of Texas at Austin, creation of overseas campuses by the University of Evansville in England and by the University of Dallas in Rome, as well as the creation of overseas student centers in Europe and South America by Stanford. When increased voluntary spending is called rising costs and becomes a basis for raising tuition, seeking more taxpayer money, or even dipping into the principle of endowments, then the kinds of economic constraints faced by competing businesses, business enterprises are clearly not operating in the academic world. Against that background, it is possible to understand the proliferation of campus amenities, such as bowling alleys and posh lounges, all counted as costs of education. Given the inhibitions against competition created by accrediting agencies and the American Association of University Professors, as well as the availability of taxpayers' money to meet quote-unquote rising costs, and the ability to tap endowment money as needed, colleges ex exhibit the kind of non-price competition through competing amenities found in the airline industry back in the days when it was insulated from competition by government regulation. After deregulation, the entry of new and lower-cost airlines brought the swift disappearance of many airline amenities. But academic institutions are protected by, among other things, accrediting agencies which treat the existing levels of amenities and prerequisites as costs that newcomers must incur in order to get the accreditation needed to attract both students and government money. Costs are especially elusive in the case of academic institutions because most are producing joint pro products, including teaching and research. There is no such thing as the average cost of a joint product. There is an average cost of raising a hog, but there's no average cost of producing bacon, which is produced jointly with ham, pork chops, and pig skin. In the academic world, where the same professors, the same libraries, and the same computer facilities are used for producing both teaching and research, any division of their costs between these two activities is arbitrary. There is another sense in which determining the cost of teaching and research is difficult. When the average teaching load at many universities reduced over the years from 12 semester hours to 6 semester hours, that required the hiring of twice as many faculty members to teach a given number of courses. Although the additional costs might be attributed to teaching in the institution's accounting records, in fact, the key reason for reducing teaching loads has been to provide more time for professors to do more research. Although it is not possible to determine the average cost of a joint product, it can be possible to determine the incremental costs. In other words, when a state legislature appropriates more money to their state university, it is possible to see how much of that additional money goes to teaching and how much to research. Very often the case is made to the legislature and the public that students deserve a better education, but after the money is appropriated, most of the additional money may go to raise faculty salaries, reduce teaching loads, or finance more research projects. Academic institutions often make the argument that their costs for educating a student are greater than the price they charge as tuition, which some take as a sign of the altruism of a nonprofit institution. But since teaching is one of the joint products of an academic institution, along with research and other ancillary activities, the meaning of such a statement is elusive. No one would take seriously a similar statement made by the owner of the New York Yankees if he said that fans who go to Yankee Stadium do not pay the full cost of running a baseball team and left the inference that his organization was an altruistic institution. The joint products being sold by the club owners include live performances of baseball games at Yankee Stadium, televised broadcasts of those games, the selling of advertising space at the park, and the renting out of Yankee Stadium for other entertainment when the baseball team is not in town during the offseason. Given the multiple sources of revenue from all these activities, there is no reason at all why fans who buy tickets at the ballpark should cover all the costs of running the organization that fields a baseball team at Yankee Stadium. Similarly, there is no reason why students should pay all the costs of all the activities at a university. 
Yet people take seriously such statements as that by the provost of Stanford University that tuition covers only 58% of the cost of educating a student, even though there is no definitive way of determining how much of the expenditures of Stanford or any other multi-purpose institution can be attributed to the teaching of students. What is clear is that the share of the revenues of state colleges and universities nationwide that comes from tuition has been rising over the years. Tuition was a little more than 21% of those revenues in 1981, but was more than 36% of those revenues in 2005. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to make the case that teaching has become a correspondingly larger part of state colleges and state universities' activities or emphasis over this, that same span of time. Meanwhile, state government's appropriations per student were lower in constant dollars in 2005 than they were back in 1981. If the argument is taken literally that colleges and universities lose money on every student, then it would be hard to explain why these institutions spend so much time and money recruiting students, and why the number of students admitted to a given institution tends to increase over time. But these things make sense when taking into account the fact that the incremental costs of adding students may be quite low. Once dormitories, libraries, sports arenas, and other student facilities have been built, the cost of having more students using them can be very modest. Put differently, when a college does not have enough of the students it admitted actually enroll to fill up the dormitories, the empty rooms may not reduce the cost of upkeep as much as the missing students' missing tuitions reduce the college's revenues. Thus, College admissions directors are under great pressure to ensure not only an ample number of applications, but also, because many students apply to multiple colleges, to ensure that a substantial percentage of the students admitted actually enroll instead of going to one of the other colleges that admitted them. As the Chronicle of Higher Education once put it, quote, As competition for new students grows tougher, College presidents are teaching admissions directors like football coaches, firing those who can't put the numbers on the board. End quote. This is not the kind of behavior to expect if colleges are in fact losing money on their students. Colleges are at least as anxious to recruit students as the New York Yankees are to get fans to come to Yankee Stadium, even though in both cases the price of admission does not cover all the costs of the organizations. One of the major costs to colleges and universities is faculty tenure. When combined with laws against quote-unquote age discrimination, tenure means virtually a lifetime guarantee of employment even for those professors who do not keep up with the advances in their respective fields or who otherwise become less effective as teachers or scholars in their later years. They can usually be replaced only by paying them a substantial sum of money to retire. Short of replacing them, Another alternative is to hire someone else to teach the same subject, subjects taught by a professor who has not kept up with the latest developments in his field. Such duplication of courses is of course expensive, but it may be the only way that a university with highly rated departments can maintain its high reputation, instead of sending less qualified students out into the world because they were taught by professors whose knowledge lags behind that of professional colleagues elsewhere. While there is little that colleges and universities can do about existing tenured faculty members, nevertheless, after these professors retire or die, the academic institutions that employed them have the option to hire replacements with tenure or to hire replacements who will not have tenure nor be appointed to the kinds of positions from which people are in line for tenure when the up or out decision has to be made. These non-tenure track positions can be as part-time faculty or adjunct instructors or lecturers who may be full-time but whom the college or university has no expectation of making permanent. With the passing years, more and more institutions are hiring increasing numbers of faculty members who do not have tenure or an expectation of tenure. In 1975, 37% of college and university faculty were full-time, tenured faculty members and an additional 20% were full-time faculty members who were on the tenure track. In short, tenure was the rule, with more than half the faculty having either already achieved tenure or being in positions such as assistant professor, where tenure was a prospect. By 2003, however, only 35% of all faculty, faculty were in either tenure or tenure track positions, 
while 46% were in part-time, non-tenured positions, and an additional 19% were in full-time, non-tenured positions. In short, tenure was out of the picture for nearly two-thirds of all faculty. While the growing numbers and proportions of non-tenure faculty appointments relieved the financial pressures on colleges and universities and permitted more flexibility in matching the numbers and kinds of professors to the changing demands in various fields, these non-tenure appointments were obviously not as desirable to the faculty members. Therefore, those elite institutions which sought to attract the top scholars to their faculties were not as free to hire large, large numbers of people to non-tenure track positions. Thus, at Stanford, only 9% of its faculty were outside the tenure system, while 73% were outside the tenure system at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Such numbers and proportions are also affected by how many introductory and lower-level courses, like freshman English or beginning mathematics, there are, since non-tenure faculty would be especially likely to be teaching these kinds of courses, with the senior tenured faculty teaching more advanced courses at either undergraduate or postgraduate levels. While some highly rated institutions may have many such courses, these kinds of courses would be expected to constitute an especially high proportion of all the courses given at community colleges. At one such college in Illinois, the College of DuPage, adjunct faculty outnumbered full-time faculty by more than three to one. At a profit-making institution like the University of Phoenix, nearly all the faculty are part-time. However, the widespread use of non-tenure track faculty is not confined to the less prestigious institutions by any means. There may also be a widespread use of non-tenure track faculty at those elite institutions where many top scholars prefer not to teach undergraduates but to concentrate on more advanced work that is more rewarding for themselves, both intellectually and financially. A science professor at the University of Michigan once put the situation very bluntly when he said, quote, Every minute I spend in an undergraduate classroom is costing me money and prestige, end quote. Nor was he or the University of Michigan unique. At Harvard, for example, a study found that there were 12,000, excuse me, 1,291 tenured and tenure-track faculty who were outnumbered by the total non-tenure-track faculty, both full-time, 1,072, and part-time, 611. What this means for students is that these students may be attracted to some big-name institutions whose prestige is generated by professors who are unlikely to teach them, especially in their freshman year, and who in some cases are not likely to teach them unless, unless and until they reach graduate school. Revenues the fact that an institution is non-profit in no way implies that it is indifferent to money or even that it is less assiduous in pursuing money than our businesses set up to make a profit. In many colleges and universities, junior faculty members cannot expect to be promoted to tenured ranks unless and until they bring in research grants from which the institution takes a sizable share of its overhead charges as overhead charges, excuse me, on average about 44% of grants from the Department of Human Health and Services, for example. As for students, not only has tuition been rising faster than the rate of inflation for decades, colleges and universities routinely engage in price discrimination that would get a private business prosecuted under the antitrust laws. While the official tuition is the same for everybody, in many of the more expensive colleges and universities, a majority of the students receive what is called quote-unquote financial aid in the form of discounts from these prices. In private industry, what is called tuition in academia would be called the list price and giving different discounts according to income would be called quote, traffic, ca uh, charging what the traffic will bear, end quote. Moreover, for a period of more than 30 years, leading academic institutions, including the Ivy League colleagues, colleges, MIT, Amherst, and a dozen other colleges and universities, formed a cartel, which met annually to coordinate the net prices that they charged particular students who would apply to more than one of the institutions in this cartel. Thus, if a particular student from a family with a particular income, bank balance, home equity, etc., had applied to Harvard, Yale, and MIT, these institutions would jointly decide to coordinate their 
financial aid, discounts in such a way that the student would be faced with the same net price to be paid at all three places. Any business which demanded such detailed financial information from customers before setting a price for its goods or services, and which then colluded with its competitors to set a uniform price to each given customer, would be prosecuted under the antitrust laws, and its executives would face a serious chance of going to jail. But when the U.S. Department of Justice belatedly began investigating this practice among academic institutions in 1989, the institutions involved were allowed to avoid any legal penalties by simply discontinuing the practice in 1991. Yet if nothing else, this cartel's action showed that being a nonprofit institution does not be, mean being an institution less assiduous in seeking money. Taxpayers are another source of revenue not overlooked by even private colleges and universities. Government subsidies for students whose families' incomes are not high enough to make college quote-unquote affordable become an incentive for colleges to keep tuition high enough to be unaffordable for large numbers of students. When the government's formula for awarding student aid subtracts a family's quote-unquote expected contribution to a student's higher education based on family income from the prices charged by colleges in order to determine how large the government subsidy will be, even a small college would forgo millions of dollars in government money annually if it kept its tuition down within the range of what most families could afford. From the standpoint of the college's financial interests, it makes more sense to keep tuition unaffordable for most of its students and use the additional money this brings in from the government to upgrade campus amenities in order to compete with other colleges that way. The fallacy that keeps this perpetual tuition escalation going is ignoring the fact that subsidizing existing costs provides incentives for those costs to rise. Academic institutions lobby Congress for money to be spent both on higher education in general and for money to be earmarked for their own particular institution. Since money earmarked in legislation for particular institutions excuse me, are a way of bypassing the peer review process by which federal agencies weigh competing requests of money, such earmarked funds are especially sought by institutions with lesser chances of getting grants on their merits in competition with more prestigious institutions. As a study noted, quote, the vast majority of university lobbying and virtually 100% of lobbying by universities that are not among the top research institutions is devoted to the pursuit of earmarks, end quote. The lobbying process was described in the same study, quote, in January, a university's administrators meet with its lobbyists to, to formulate lobbying strategy for the upcoming fiscal year. They prioritize potential earmark requests by the likelihood of success and identify elected officials to lobby. They will typically target the representative and or senators from the university's district and state. In March, the university begins to lobby the targeted representatives to include its request in the appropriations legislation. After the August recess, there's a push to get the request included in one of the 13 appropriations bills. The cycle ends in late autumn, as the appropriations bills are sent to the president, end quote. Such organized lobbying campaigns for earmarked federal money were pioneered by Tufts University in the 1970s when they hired professional lobbyists, a practice then followed by other institutions. The return on these investments in lobbying for earmarks may be indicated by the rise of federal earmarked funds for academic institutions from $17 million in 1980 to nearly $1.7 billion in 2001. Even allowing for inflation, this hundredfold increase in money still amounts to more than a 50-fold increase in real terms. Universities engaged in lobbying for federal money spend an average of more than $100,000 a year each on such lobbying and receive back in federal money more than a million dollars each. Universities located in the district or state of a congressional representative or senator who is a member of the House or Senate Appropriations Committee receive back even higher rates of return on their lobbying investments than the eightfold return received by other universities. Again, being a nonprofit institution does not mean less hotly pursuing money than enterprises whose incomes are called 
profit. Many from outside sor- excuse me. Money from outside sources, government, industry, foundations, and individual donors are crucial for the research that in turn is crucial for both individual and institutional prosperity and prestige. Even richly endowed universities like Harvard and Yale, receiving millions of dollars annually from the earnings of their endowments in the financial markets, do not finance most of their research from their own money, but from money received from government and other outside sources. In fiscal year 2004, for example, Yale University spent more than 10 times as much money from the government as from its own money to finance its research and development, and Harvard spent none of its own money for that purpose, while spending $399 million in government money. Intercollegiate sports, especially football and basketball, are another source of considerable revenue for some colleges and universities, though this revenue seldom contributes anything toward the educational activities of these institutions. A former president of Yale University summed up the the situation succinctly, quote, I have yet to see the laboratory or library or dormitory built with football or basketball revenues, end quote. On the contrary, these and other sports more commonly cost more money than they bring in, even though the top intercollegiate sports can bring in millions of dollars in gate receipts, television rights, and other sources of revenue. In 2006, Ohio State University became the first academic institution to spend more than $100 million in it, on its many athletic programs. However, with a top-ranked football team playing a bowl game, its hundred. Its $101.8 million in expenses was covered by $104.7 million in revenue. At most colleges and universities, however, financial losses are the rule for athletic programs. Despite some creative accounting used to conceal how much some intercollegiate sports are costing, the head of the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA, quote, Acknowledge that, when properly accounted, fewer than 10 of the more than 1,000 college athletic departments run a surplus, end quote, according to the New York Times. The NCAA is a nationwide cartel whose guiding principle is that none of the vast sums of money involved in intercollegiate sports shall be paid to those who play the games at the risk of their bodies. Meanwhile, those who direct these athletic contests from the sideline can be handsomely rewarded. More than 100 years ago, when Harvard hired its first paid football coach, his salary, quote, was 30% more than the best paid Harvard professor received and was comparable to Elliott's salary after his almost 40 years as president, end quote. Such patterns remain common today, except that it is now common for football coaches to be paid more than the presidents of their respective universities. While it is still rare for a university president's total compensation package, salary plus benefits, to be a million dollars a year, a number of football coaches have had compensations of more than a million dollars a year each, and 10 college coaches have compensation of more than two million. None of the presidents of these 10 institutions had an annual compensation of as much as $800,000. Even a college's top recruiters of high school football players can earn more than $200,000 a year, which is more than the the average salary of a full professor at Harvard. It may seem strange, if not irrational, for a college or university to be paying a huge salary for someone who is directing an activity which is usually losing money on net balance. But again, it is necessary to distinguish what is beneficial from the standpoint of the institution as a whole from what is beneficial from the standpoint of the individuals in charge of making particular decisions within that institution. Moreover, short-run economics differs from long-run economics. In the short run, a sports stadium and other athletic facilities have already been built, so the only costs that matter are the incremental costs of maintaining and operating these facilities which may be a small fraction of the total costs that include the cost of building such facilities. The revenues that a successful sports program can bring in, whether in gate receipts, television rights, bowl game money, etc., may easily exceed the incremental costs of keeping the athletic program alive and successful. On the other hand, if the football or basketball team is a chronic loser in its games, all these sources of revenue may fall drastically and fail to cover even the incremental costs of running an athletic program. 
Given these incentives and constraints, hiring a coach who is likely to produce a winning season is worth paying a very large salary. What about the long run? In the long run, the stadium and other athletic facilities will need costly renovation or rebuilding. From a purely economic standpoint, the college or university might be better off at that point to discontinue intercollegiate athletic programs that are costing more money than they are bringing in. However, from the standpoint of a college or university president, is it worth stirring up a hornet's nest of outrage from students, alumni, and perhaps even some faculty members by discontinuing a football or basketball program that the president has been repeatedly authorizing for years? A college or university president has few incentives to think in long-run terms beyond the president's own term in office, which can be cut short precisely by outraging various constituencies of the institution. Since universities participating in intercollegiate athletics are nonprofit organizations, there are no stockholders to complain about the inefficiency of subsidizing money-losing activities, much less mount a campaign to get rid of a chief executive who is reducing their return on their investment. In a profit-based enterprise, any money-losing operation is a threat to the institution's long-run ec economic position, and that threat is reflected immediately in its stock price, in a lowered rating of its bonds, and in a growing reluctance of banks or other financial institutions to let them have money. It is significant that the relatively few academic institutions that are run for profit, including the University of Phoenix, which has more students than any non-profit university, do not have football teams or stadiums. Few, if any, people have a direct personal interest in the long run economic or educational consequences of decisions made by officials of most colleges and universities. Students are passing through in a few years, professors move easily from one institution to another, and few college or university presidents today stay at the same institution for decades, as Charles Eliot once did at Harvard, or as Nicholas Murray Butler did at Columbia, and Robert Hutchins did at the University of Chicago. Presidents of lower-ranked colleges or universities may aspire to become presidents of higher-ranked institutions, and presidents of the latter may aspire to high positions in the political or foundations world. But seldom is there a long-term commitment to a given institution today that would provide incentives for students, faculty, or administrators to take a long-term view of the consequences for the institution of the decisions currently being made, whether in intercollegiate athletics or in other aspects of decision-making in higher education. All right, that concludes today's read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video. So I did not realize how long that read was going to be, uh, and it was pretty doggone long. So I'm going to do my best to keep the analysis and review as concise as I possibly can. No guarantees, however. Um, so this was a bit, this was a read that I could understand as being a bit on the confusing side, and so we'll actually get something wrong. So we're just going to focus on the parts that... Um, uh, We'll just focus on cl clearing up some of the confusion. And I think the easiest way to clear up that confusion is to just simply use use terms in finance that Thomas isn't actually using, that Sol isn't actually using. So in the case of costs, we're going to call them, if you just replace the term costs with expenses, if you replace the term prices with revenues, and if you replace the uh, incremental costs with variable costs as opposed to fixed costs, hopefully that should, right then and there, clear up some of the confusion. So as far as the book, the chat, the reads main point. I think basically the main point he's trying to make is that shielding anything from market influences means its influences will not come from what the greater body of people are willing to consensually exchange for what services are provided. So to put that in simplest terms, shielding any enterprise from market influences protects them from responding to market influences which means they don't have to provide the best product for the best price. And I think that's what he's referring to throughout uh, page one, 111. And I, and I also think that's what he means when he brings this 
basically this point up on page 117. The fallacy that keeps this perpetual tuition escalation going is ignoring the fact that subsidizing existing costs provides incentives for those costs to rise, which means that they no longer have to respond to market influences. It, there's, no, there's no incentive to keep costs down because if you're responding to market influences, the only way you can avoid having to decrease your costs to create that competitive advantage is to create a competitive advantage somewhere else by, for example, producing a far better quality product. So there's lots of other, so I hope that's kind of cleared up the confusion in the chapter. Um, I hope that's kind of made the main point as clear as possible. If you get nothing, you could stop here with the analysis. We're only three minutes into our analysis and review. Honestly, you could probably stop here and get out what you need to from the chapter. There are a lot of other minor points, um, but I'm trying to make this brief. So let's just focus. So again, I was just trying to focus on the areas where there might be confusion, which means that you could basically stop the video right here if you want and get the main point out at least. But there's two other areas that were a little bit more specific than the main point that he's trying to make. Um, and I'll start with the first, if we're going to get just a little bit more specific, which uh, is, is hap happens on page 111. There is no such thing as the average cost of a joint product. Okay. The statement could be true. The statement could be untrue. It's not actually using the terms of accounting and finance that would make it, from a technical standpoint, an absolute truth. Um, so what he's basically talking about is direct cost accounting. Uh, and this is very difficult to do based on varying activity. For, so, for example, if you own a factory, there's a lot of processes that go on in a factory. If, if you're making... Uh, if you're making the camera people are watching this, you guys are watching this on, that I'm recording this on, if you're even making just something as simple as this microphone, there's a lot of steps in that process. There's a lot of things that Sony is doing in making the camera that's recording this video. And each one of those activities needs to have a cost assigned to it. So this can be very difficult. And here's what I mean by that. There's some overhead that's, that's going to have to be incurred. Well, what part of the overhead should you attribute to each process? Again, that's going to be very difficult to determine, which is why in the case of revenues, you really don't even look at, at, at you know, attributing direct revenues to um, an actual process within it. This is what he means by, by you can't take an average of all of these sort of things because it's, it's, it's an inaccurate way to attribute a direct costing, a direct accounting of those costs to those activities. Um, so all he's saying is that the attribution of overall spending to a particular activity is difficult. Um, and the technical term that we're using here is activity-based costing. Okay, I'm not gonna go any further than that because activity-based costing as a concept is kind of a senior level accounting course in college. And it's it stems from uh, managerial cost accounting. So. I would encourage you in that realm to just do your own research. Uh, and if it's something that, that you're unfamiliar with and is making the, the read more difficult, I apologize. It's an entire course and an entire lecture, at least, that I have to give you in order to make that any more clear than, than I've tried to make it. The second point, the second thing I want to clear up in terms of specifics um, is the athletics football. Yes, I did make a pun in this video. And the reason I need to clear that up is because this is a, this is one of the very, very, very rare and very few cases where Seoul is actually wrong. Um, I, and I know it's utter sacrilege to say that. I realize that. But this is a place where he's actually wrong. So the reason he's wrong is because, and it's it's difficult, it's, it's really difficult to, to see how he was able to get this wrong because he misses his own point, which he makes on uh, page 119. Though this revenue seldom contributes anything towards the educational activities of the, uh, sorry, uh, intercollegiate sports, especially football and basketball. Uh, hold on, sorry. He uh, misses the point that he makes on page, my notes are actually incorrect here. Ah, 120. Moreover, short-run economics differs from long-run economics. 
So that's that's the point that he makes that he misses, and it's the point he makes and misses in saying something like intercollegiate sports, especially football and basketball, are another source of considerable revenue for some colleges and universities, though this revenue seldom contributes anything towards the educational activities of these institutions. So in the very in a very short sighted skin deep uh, investigation to this, yeah, maybe, maybe. But there is such a thing as the what's called the cost of doing business. And this is a thing where Sowell's very good at economics. Sowell's very good at philosophy. He's not as good in the world of business, especially when it comes to finance and finance and accounting. Um, and I've, I pointed this out as a weakness on some of my other reviews of his reads. I forget what the, what the read I pointed this out more explicitly was. So... There is such a thing as the cost of doing business. There are certain programs within any business, even for-profit businesses, that within the program you're going to lose money, but you have to do in order to be able to do the thing that makes you all kinds of money. Um, these are called, sometimes we call, uh, in, in retail this would be called complementary products. Uh, and there might be some other things that are called complementary services. And complementary in this case doesn't mean free. It means they act as a complement, as a complement to another pro good or good or service. So in the case of of athletics departments at a university, even if they're not Division One varsity athletics, what you may be looking at as is the cost of doing business, because these athletic programs may attract students. And in doing so, bring in other rev sources of revenue. So, for example, if that's the hair that is split, if you're like me, if you're like me, and you have excellent GPA in high school, completely off the charts uh, SAT scores, and you took all of the best, uh, best and most difficult courses in high school, you've got excellent references, and you also have a situation where you have. Um, a, an excellent in, uh, extracurricular activities, uh, as in you were, a, uh, in my case, you are a letterman in, in all kinds of varsity sports and you have the uh, the record within those sports um, that to stand out. And of course, you were an Eagle Scout and you were a scholar in all of these other programs as well. If you're that candidate, right? There's a, that If that's the best student, then you're if you're in a position like me, you can just go to... You're, you're going to get admitted to any university you want to. Now, I didn't apply to the Ivy League schools because when I was in high school, when I was making these applications, it was in the very dawn of the, of, uh, the 2000s. And as a result, all of the Ivy League schools were just, I, I'll, I'll say it, I shouldn't be saying things like this on this channel. I've been trying to keep it professional, but I had no intention in, in being surrounded by pretentious douches. Um, so I didn't even apply to the Ivy League schools. But I got into three of the two schools I applied to. Yes, that's true. I actually got into a school I didn't apply to. I got a letter of acceptance from a school I didn't apply to. I know, I know, because it was my grades were that good. Uh, and my resume up to that point looked that good. Excuse me while I toot my own horn. But the point is that having these athletic programs may be the hair that a candidate like me splits between going to a place like Geneseo or Binghamton University. Now, I wound up getting into Geneseo. I wound up getting into uh, accepted into Geneseo and Binghamton. So here's here's something that was an attractant to me when it came to Binghamton University that had nothing whatsoever to do with, with the actual academics. And that is, I'm going to spend four years of my life in this place. And I was impressed academically with Geneseo. However, if you've ever been to Geneseo, New York, it's in the middle of nowhere and off outside of the campus itself there is nothing there for miles right it's a 45 minute drive to the outskirts of rochester and there's nothing otherwise being i was i'm not a huge fan of being in huge cities but binghamton Uni university was located in vestal new york is basically adjacent to the city of binghamton which is a city of roughly 50,000 people and the greater metro is around 100 to 200,000 people so that was something in the amenities that were surrounding the universities where I said, man, I really don't want to go to Geneseo because I'm going to lose my mind and it's going to adversely, and me losing my mind is going to adversely affect my grades. 
So I decided to go. That was one of the hairs I split between Binghamton University and Geneseo. Another hair you might split is the fact that Binghamton had a wrestling program. And that was something I was into. Not that I was likely to necessarily make the team, but it was something that, because I don't want to be spending literally all of my life in the classroom, maybe there's occasionally things I want to do that aren't directly in the classroom because we're human beings and this is how human beings operate. You know, having a, div a, a Division One varsity wrestling program was something I might want to go see a match every once in a while. And this might be the hair that students split. And not only do you get their tuition, most importantly, if you're attracting the best students, um, the best students are the ones that you would project to make more money once they enter the real world, which means you are more likely to have endowment money. The other thing that this, that having, let's say we're talking about Ohio State, like he talks about, like Sol talks about in this program, if they've got a great football program, let's say that they, ha that, that, let's say they make it to the national championship game and let's say they lose it. Well, what's your generic memory of your experience at Ohio State like? What if they win the national championship? Now, what's your generic memory of your experience at Ohio State like? Is it more positive? Well, if it's more positive, it may result in greater contributions and greater uh, uh, charitable contributions, donations to the endowment. It may be that you get some doctor who is contributing to a medical school program because his overall memory of the experience in college was positive, which was enhanced by the, the football team winning the national title, like say at Ohio State. Um, I'm getting a little bit long, so I'm going to use an analogy so people understand what I mean by this. In a hardware store, you may, you're going to have a paint department, and people are going to come in to the paint department for paint, which means that if they're coming in for the paint, what's the competitive advantage that you have in the paint department? They're, all, they're coming for the paint. They don't care about anything else. They're coming for the paint. Well, if you have exactly the same paint as the other store, but you're willing to sell it at a full-on loss, that program may cost you money. And it may, it, may, it may mean, well, why are we carrying paint? Why do we carry so many cans of paint? It would make sense for us to carry less paint, right? Adding more cans of paint doesn't help us. But where we make up our money is on the, on the brushes and rollers and stuff where we're going to gouge people because people don't care once they've bought the paint, they don't care how much they're going to pay for the brushes and rollers and such. So in that case, you have a complementary product, the rollers, the brushes, clean up supplies, drop cloths, tape, etc. right? In that case, from a business standpoint, it may make sense to lose money on the paint and make it back on all the complementary products. And in doing so, what happens is, is you put that other store out of business because people aren't, don't care if they pay extra for the brushes but they do care if they pay extra for the paint. So you're going to get all of the paint customers. And in the end, you wind up making money because you're making it all back. Your loss is back on the, and then some on the brushes and tape and rollers and drop cloths, et cetera. We actually had this experience in my real life. Uh, when I was superintendent of a, of a cemetery, we actually got a credit card machine so we could, for the first time ever, uh, have a credit card, ha have be able to accept credit cards at the cemetery. Uh, and that's important because our payment and when our revenue, when, when we, what we were charging for, there are only a handful of things we charged, um, charged for. And those things were thousands and thousands of dollars. So since I'm not in an affluent community, um, a lot of people were going to have to put those expenses on their credit card or find another, find another cemetery. Uh, and that's what people were telling me. So I got us a credit card machine. And yes, the program itself, if we're doing a direct accounting of the program itself and looking only within the vacuum of the program itself, like the football program, only within the vacuum of the football program, definitely lost us money. We definitely lost money on that. However, however, we had innumerable customers come to us and say, if you didn't have that credit card machine, I would have up and left. End of story. So those th multi-thousand dollar revenue, we, those multi-thousand dollar purchases that our clients were making came because we had the credit card machine, because we had the ability to accept credit cards. So under the balance sheet, that revenue is not going to be attributed to the credit card machine. It's going to be attributed to something completely different. It's going to be attributed to grave sales, grave and lot sales, or it's going to be open burial rights sales, or it's going to be attributed to openings or um, foundation fees, etc., something along those lines. 
So in this case, Sol actually may be getting this one wrong. So it's definitely not always the case, but Sal misses the point pretty badly on this one. And, and this is, I'll, I'll wrap this up with, with where he misses this point, which is on page 119. Meanwhile, those who direct these athletic contests from the sideline can be handsomely rewarded. He's talking about the coaches making way more money than the presidents. And there's a reason for this. Because in the end, what does it take to get Urban Meyer to go to Ohio State? Is Urban Meyer going to go be the head coach at Ohio State for $100,000 a year? Absolutely not. Is the president, whoever the heck that is, whose name I, I don't even know, which tells you something about their market value, is the president of Ohio State somebody who would be president for $100,000? Maybe. $200,000? Maybe. $600,000? Probably. Almost certainly. $800,000? You bet. Is Urban Meyer going to take a gigantic pay cut to stay at Ohio State? No. No. Absolutely not. And that may be the difference between some, you know, Elon Musk down the road donating back to this program that he has just a general, viscerally positive memory of his experiences in college. Urban Meyer handed the ball off to Marshawn and they won the game. Somebody else might not hand the ball off to Marshawn. Somebody else might throw the ball and that ball might get intercepted in the end zone. And then instead of winning the big game, you lose the big game. And your overall visceral experience, your memory of the, the four years there is tainted. And it may be tainted by just enough that that Elon Musk guy, when he gets that phone call, he sees that phone number and says, nah, I'm not answering that phone. Never mind that place. So I know. Utter blasphemy to say that in this case, Soul got it wrong. Now, this isn't to say that, again, reminder, this is definitely not always the case. But there may be, there may be a reason to justify these athletic programs as part of the cost of doing business. And it's perfectly reasonable to expect that that might be the case. Now, it may not be the case. It may only be the case in, say, one or two institutions. The reason we don't know this harkens back to what Sowell's main point was, which is when you preclude uh, a, a, an enterprise from having to respond to market influences, you don't know, there's no real way of knowing if what they're doing is the most efficient way to be spending their money, if the activities and programs they're offering are the best and are the best activities and programs to be offering for the money. So hopefully that has cleared things up in this read. Our next read is going in Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies is going to uh, be a very short read, which will wrap up chapter four, and that'll be the section entitled Summary and Conclusion. So until then, this has been Mike signing off. Night, everybody.